In this lesson, we'll be learning about growing microbes, how quickly they grow, and some of the precautions we need to take when growing them. The specification has the following to say about this. Bacteria multiply by simple cell division, binary fission. Now most of us know about bacteria because of the very small proportion of them that can cause us harm. But most bacteria don't cause us harm, and many are actually essential to our health. In fact, there are more bacterial cells in your body than there are human cells, and they do a vital job in most cases. Some just get in the way of harmful bacteria to stop them invading, but others help us to digest our food effectively. Now, despite having powerful microscopes to use, because they're so small, it's terribly difficult to work with individual bacteria. So we tend to grow them in very large numbers to study them. The two main ways of growing bacteria are on the surface of an agar plate or within the fluid of a nutrient broth. In each case, the culture medium will need to contain everything that a bacteria will need to live. Water is needed as a solvent to allow molecules to move about and interact, and as a reagent in metabolism and to form the cytoplasm of the new cell. There'll need to be carbohydrates, such as glucose, because they're needed as an energy source. There'll need to be some amino acids, because they're needed for the bacteria to produce the proteins that it needs, such as the enzymes of metabolism and the structural components of its cell. There'll need to be some mineral ions, because they're the, the components needed in metabolic reactions. Now the precise mix of the chemicals that are needed to, in the culture medium will determine which microbes are able to grow well and which would struggle. So there's no single culture medium that's suitable for all microbes. So different recipes can be used to promote the growth of particular types of microbe. Now if it's a virus that's being cultured, which is very often not the case in um, school laboratories, but if it is a virus that's being cultured, then living cells will need to be added to the culture medium. Because viruses only function as parasites, they're not a living cell in their own right. For the added cells to survive, it may then also be necessary to add hormones or growth factors. But these aren't for the virus itself, just for its host. Culturing viruses is commonplace in medical laboratories, but you're more likely to be asked about growing bacteria. Now there are microbes growing all around us. They're in the air that you breathe and on the food that you eat. They're far too small to see with the naked eye, but they're still there nonetheless. When we grow microbes in our experiments, we need to make sure that the bacteria that we grow come from where we intend, and not just those that have dropped onto the culture medium out of the air when the lid was off, or those that just happened to be sticking to the equipment that we used. So we need to sterilize the equipment before we get started. Now bacteria can grow phenomenally quickly, given the right conditions. Some will reproduce every 20 minutes. So if you started with one bacteria cell at 12 noon, you'd have over 2 million by 7 o'clock that evening. This graph shows how bacterial numbers can rise from a single individual at 12 o'clock to over 2 million at 7 o'clock. When a quantity doubles, and it keeps on doubling, this is called exponential growth. And the graph of this is a steeply rising curve. Now on the vertical scale of this first graph, it keeps adjusting so that everything will fit. The steeply rising curve in the graph is obvious. This second graph 
shows exactly the same data, but the scale is fixed. The steeply rising curve in this case is always there, but it only becomes obvious to see once the numbers are high enough. Very often, where a graph needs to show information at massively different scales, scientists will use logarithms. The pH scale of the hydrogen ion concentration is like this. So this third graph shows bacterial numbers on a logarithm scale. Each vertical unit on this graph is 10 times bigger than the previous unit. Now when plotted like this, the graph is a straight line. Now you may also need to estimate the size of a population and there is a useful equation for this. The equation uses the time it takes for a typical bacterium to divide and this is called its generation time. If we wait that length of time then the population size will have doubled. So if we divide the time the bacteria have been growing for by the time it takes them to divide once we'll know how many times the population size has doubled. So, the size of a population is equal to the starting size multiplied by 2 to the power n, where n is the number of times that the bacterial population has doubled, or the time divided by the generation time. So, Applying this to the example I just mentioned, the time is 7 hours, which is 7 times 60 minutes or 420 minutes. 420 minutes divided by the 15 minute generation time gives n as 420 divided by 20, which is 21. So the population size will be 2 to the power 21. So the population size is 2 million. 97,152. Now we can use an easier example to see how this works. If we start with a single bacterium which takes 30 minutes to divide, how many will there be in an hour and a half? Well an hour and a half is 90 minutes which is 90 divided by 30 is 3, that's n. So we'll have 2 to the power 3 which is 8 bacteria. Now we can test this out by just writing the numbers out in this simple example. So at time zero we've got one bacterium. 30 minutes later we've doubled and got two. 60 minutes later we've doubled and got four. 90 minutes later we've doubled and got eight. Now the reason that bacteria reproduce so quickly is that their cells are so simple. There's only one simple chromosome to organise and there's no enclosing membrane. Eukaryotic chromosomes are enclosed in the nucleus and they have a much more complex structure where the DNA is packaged more tightly using special protein molecules. But bacteria reproduce using binary fission and that's much more simple than mitosis in eukaryotes. In mitosis there's multiple chromosomes that need to be moved about and organized by microtubules. In the prokaryotic chromosome it's just a single DNA molecule that's first copied, then attached to the cell membrane and then when the cell pulls apart each version of the copied chromosome move to a different side of the cell with the cell membrane that they are already attached to. So two new cells are then formed. Now this is an active process so aside from the availability of food, water, space and a suitable temperature, there's a build-up of waste products. 
These are all the key factors we need to take into account when we're figuring out how quickly a bacterial population will grow. Now under ideal conditions, bacteria numbers will grow exponentially. But the availability of this food, water, space and the build-up of waste products will all cause the growth rate to decline as the numbers grow. Now this gives a graph of bacterial numbers an S shape or a sigmoid shape. Numbers increasing quickly and then slowing down. Eventually bacteria will only reproduce as resources or space permits when others die. So the rate at which old bacteria die and the rate at which new bacteria are produced will be the same and the overall population will stay the same. This large population of individuals will have an effect on the conditions though, so the build-up of toxic waste products in the culture will eventually cause the population numbers to decline. In practice, the steep initial rise in bacterial numbers may not occur immediately. There's often an initial lag phase and during this time the bacteria will be needing to manufacture the particular enzymes that they need to make use of the nutrients that are available to them. And once their energy stores have increased they will also need to copy the DNA, the proteins and the other cell contents before they undergo binary fission. Since bacteria are all around and they have such a rapid growth rate and very simple requirements, we need to take deliberate steps to make sure that only the bacteria that we introduce to the culture medium are the ones that we intend to introduce. This is called aseptic technique. So we need to wash our hands and we need to sterilise all the equipment before we start. It's also a good idea to wipe down the desk and have, with an ethanol solution and to wear a clean lab coat and make sure all hair is tied back. Sterilising the equipment is usually carried out using an autoclave. That's a device that heats water containing the equipment and it allows the pressure to build up so that the water boils at a higher temperature than normal, above 100 degrees centigrade. When placing bacteria onto a culture medium, we need to expose the culture medium to the air and therefore airborne bacteria as little as possible. We do this by lifting the lid only a small amount and shielding the agar beneath it. We keep the lid over the base to act as a shield so that any fallen bacteria don't get onto the agar. Working beside a lit Bunsen burner is also helpful because that causes a current of rising air to prevent contaminants such as bacteria from dropping down onto your work. Wire inoculating loops which are used to transfer bacteria have to be passed through a Bunsen flame until the wire glows red and then allowed to cool and that will kill any bacteria that are already on the loop from previous inoculations or from falling out of the air. Agar plates need to have their lids secured in place with sticky tape. Now this is not to seal the plate because the growing bacteria will still need a source of oxygen, it's just to make sure that the lid doesn't fall off and therefore spread bacteria around. It's also to stop other bacteria contaminating the culture medium. In the warm, moist conditions inside a petri dish, water will evaporate from the agar and it might condense on the lid of the petri dish. Once sealed, the petri dishes are kept upside down in the incubator so drips of water can't 
drip off the lid to contaminate the neighbouring areas of the Petri dish. Bacterial colonies will usually grow quickest in warm conditions. The bacteria that cause diseases in humans are usually very well adapted to the temperatures found in humans. To avoid growing disease causing bacteria by accident, it's important that we avoid giving any that might happen to be in our experiment a competitive advantage by using human body temperature. A warm environment allows bacteria to grow quickly, but if it's too warm we risk growing dangerous bacteria. To avoid this problem, school laboratories don't incubate above 25 degrees centigrade, which is well below human body temperature. Now industrial laboratories, in hospitals for example, may use higher temperatures to grow bacteria quicker but they will have far stricter hygiene precautions to prevent bacteria spreading by accident. Once the bacterial colonies have grown and have been inspected, then they are normally killed in an autoclave before being disposed of. Don't forget to download the resources for this video from the link in the description, especially the notes template. LearnFix has a lot more to offer than just the videos on the exam questions. The most popular aspect is the set of 12 online learning games we have for each topic. These help you practice your recall of the details. Now when it comes to revision, LearnFix is there to help. After each section of the syllabus, there's a diagnostic quiz to help focus your revision efforts. You can then use a progress report to look back at the details for that particular topic, what went well and what needs more work. We're adding new features every month, so visit us at learnfix.com to find out more.